Hello everyone, and after nearly three months off, welcome back to Post Podium, the podcast where former Jeopardy contestants are instead given questions and asked to provide answers. I am your host, Jarek Bruel, and a lot has happened since the last episode. Season 39 saw the continuation of Luigi de Guzman's streak until Emmett Stanton had something to say about it. Then we had David Sibley go on a streak at the end of September until it was snapped by Jeopardy super champion Chris Panulo, who finished his streak as a 21 game winner with over $700,000 in winnings. Over the course of his run, Chris quickly climbed the ranks of the leaderboard of legends. He is now 7th in all-time winnings on the show, including tournaments, and in 6th place for most consecutive games won in the regular season, right between Julia Collins and Matea Roach. But the regular season wasn't the only exciting thing that happened recently. The inaugural Jeopardy! Second Chance competition, yes competition, not tournament, it was always a competition, I have no idea what you're talking about, took place from October 17th to 28th, and subsequently transitioned to the Tournament of Champions, which took place from October 31st to November 21st. But this episode isn't about the SEC or TOC. In a few moments, you'll hear my conversation with John Folk, a software team lead originally from El Paso, Texas, a four-game Jeopardy! champion, and recently a Tournament of Champions semifinalist. He's also the owner of the website Geometry, which takes data from Jeopardy's official box scores and J-Archive's historical game data and compiles it to provide more insights into contestant performance. I'll be asking him questions about what this data can tell us, how future contestants can use it for themselves, and how exactly John used Geometry to inform his TOC prep. Rest assured, both the SEC and TOC will be discussed in upcoming episodes of the podcast. For now, we hope you enjoy this episode of Post Podium. Why don't we start with a simple introduction, your name, when you appeared on Jeopardy, and how well you did and finished. Okay, Uh, my name is John Folkt. My name is also TK Folkt. If you see that name online, that is also me. Uh, But I competed under my official name, John. Uh, I was a four-day champion in February 2021. Uh, and then was invited to participate in the 2022 Tournament of Champions, uh, where I won a quarterfinal game and then lost in the semifinal. That was recently on. You might have seen it. Uh, It was not that long ago. Great. And before we dive straight into numbers, stats, data, and the like, John, I actually found out we share something in common while I was doing research on your original run. We both managed to buzz in and respond correctly to a clue which would otherwise be our undoing if we got it wrong. On a clue about Pinoy's, I responded with, what is Filipino? And on a clue about baseball, you responded with, what is inside the park? Now, I didn't get to watch your original run when it aired, so could you describe what that feeling was like? I think in your interview with MLB Network last year, you said you froze. Yeah, uh, I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad this is coming up again because it is the question that keeps coming up. In that case, it was a it was a category on sports items that all start with I N, and it was a clue about a type of home run with a lot of running. My instinct to buzz in occurred, uh, and the like background process of the brain to fill in what the answer actually is uh, did not bother doing its job because it, I don't know. It's like this is easy. You've got this, and like, no, you're responsible for, for co- coming up with the answer. Please do that. <laughs> um, and so I just sort of sat there for a moment trying to will myself into the answer and got it. My friends were very into this reaction of, like, you can see his fear and, wow, this would be something. <laughs> 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 like, this is the only thing that matters in the moment. Ken also noticed and was, said, you yeah, know, there would be trouble back at work. Uh, if, if if you did this. In the process of that, of Ken saying that and of there just being a, a reaction to begin with, it became something that I talked about with the reporter for The Athletic, which then got picked up by Evil Me Network. And when they interviewed me, they asked, like, oh, you missed a baseball question. And they brought it up on the screen and were like, how did you miss this? This is easy. And uh, it's like, no, I didn't. Oh, my God. What is going on? Could we please all just like remember what actually happened here which is the most nerve-wracking six hundred dollars in my life it was it was great (laughs) like a deer caught in headlights love it uh all right now that we've broken the ice a little bit i want to let our audiences know in advance that a lot of what we're about to discuss might be a little bit more analytical than what they might be used to on the show so if that doesn't sound too riveting or if you want to skip ahead i provided timestamps in the episode description for the different topics we'll be covering however i think i can speak for john and myself when i say that we'd appreciate it a lot if you listened anyway so for those who don't know and i know you briefly described it in your toc quarterfinal contestant interview Could you describe what geometry is in detail? Why did you make it? When did you make it? How did you make it? Etc. 
Sure. Back in January, Jeopardy started publishing box scores. It's part of their effort to Jeopardy is a sport. Uh, we want to see more statistics of what's going on. We want people to be involved in, in looking at the game more in depth. Part of what they put out there is the attempts data on how many times people are ringing in in each round or attempting to ring in in each round. They also have the number of buzzes, which is the actual number of times that people get in. Uh, if you were really diligent about scraping J-Archive uh, in certain ways, you could get to that information already. They put out the the attempt data, the box scores in picture format. They're, they're in PNGs. And those aren't the, the most readily usable form of, of data for doing research. Step one of doing any, any set of data exploration is to just gather the data, get it cleaned up, um, get it ready to do something with. And images that have numbers in them are not a promising source. At that point, I was on the bubble still of whether or not I was going to make the Tournament of Champions. Uh, the attempt data didn't really have any bearing on if I did or not, but it was really something for myself of, I'm going to want to look at this because I want to know. I have a feeling inside myself of how I did, what my numbers would have been like if they had been published. And gathering this data now, I can see where where do I fit in. Not not so much do I have a chance of making the four game win streak was already set in stone. And that's not really something that a game metric is going to tell you anything about. But if I were to make it, what would I need to know about myself? How what would be the the best areas to improve in? Is it is it even reasonable to ask if there are areas to improve in? How different are high caliber players from each other? What what are players different from each other on? So in order to to get that, I just started making a spreadsheet with the the data that they were publishing just moved into a Google Sheet just so that it would be available for me to use and hey, if no one else did this at all, then I could post a CSV somewhere on the internet and other people could also use it. Over time, as I was gathering more of it, there was enough uh, data at about the time that Amy lost. They started publishing box scores partway through her run. At about the time that she lost, there was enough data to start just making some graphs and being like, what made this game different? This game is interesting because this super champ was defeated. What was there anything in particular? What happened in it? And so you make some graphs, you look and see where that dot shows up differently in different metrics. And you start saying, hey, maybe that's important, but I've also got like 12 games worth of data. So maybe it's not. And from there, I just started making more graphs that I thought were useful for myself and understanding how the game was working. It became too much trouble to do this one by one every time the spreadsheet with graphs like spread out all over different tabs was not working for me anymore. And so I set up uh, just a little local website on my own laptop uh, in order to, the, here's the data, just make the same graphs, update them every time I look at this. And then I got that ready to put online uh, because I thought other people might want to see it. I was posting some stuff online on Twitter, screenshots of graphs that I was making. And you know, some people are interested in it. Most people are not. That's okay. Uh, but for the people who were, it would be something to say, hey, like if you want to be looking at it, here's here's a thing. And maybe a little bit of, all, of it was also, hey, Jeopardy, like I'm still looking at your show. Please don't forget me. I, I am here. Please invite me back for a tournament <laughs> or something. Uh, uh, maybe maybe a little bit, which uh, then when uh, when I went to the show and they were for the tournament and they were recording uh, podcast interviews, doing uh, interview segment set up. They were very clear. They wanted me to talk about geometry that I had that I had done this and that it existed and that I had been looking at it. And I I said I wasn't sure if you even knew about this uh, what I was doing. And Sarah Foss like, no, we know, <laughs> <laughs> we are we are aware. Yeah, over time, it's just been something I keep up with every day. It's not really a, a big amount of time for me to do maintenance as games happen to just add data to it and continuing to do exploration. There's some things that I've talked about with uh, people that I've worked with. The Dodger front office is maybe weirdly, maybe not weirdly excited sometimes about the idea of modeling a different sport <laughs> uh, and, and trying their hand at that. You know, there, there is a community of people who are interested in, in looking at the game analytically, often former contestants in general uh, that I have less personal connection with, but also just people who want to see it through a different way, maybe look at their own preparation, 
uh, if they might be on the show. Just want to understand what what makes someone work on the show. And the answer to that is different for different people a lot of the time. It's been interesting. Uh, I also do use this as an opportunity to uh, try out different technical things uh, and just try and get away with the, the skimpiest engineering that I can that still does the job. Uh, <laughs> so it's also something of a technical challenge for me uh, in terms of just making sure that something stays up and available and, and useful, even at the low traffic levels. Uh, but for example, I was very pleased when uh, after discussing it on the show, there was a huge spike of traffic that was easily handled. <laughs> nice. Um, that was <laughs> that was that was a, a good a sense of triumph for me. Uh, not as much as basking in the glow of having won the game where I discussed that, but the the uptime was a, an engineering challenge to think through what I wanted to do there without having to pay a bunch of money or spend a lot of my actual personal time doing it. Um, there are a few stats on geometry that have made watching Jeopardy even more enjoyable, especially as Chris Panulo is blitzing through his opponents recently. Uh, aside from what's available in the official box scores and J archive, these stats are based on some assumptions that you've made, right? Could you tell us what those assumptions are and how you plan on refining these statistics in the future? Yeah, uh, I guess I could walk through what the development of those was in the first place, and that'll that'll cover what the assumptions are to begin with. For timing and for solo these are both based on the idea that we have kind of two sets of data we have a within a certain round we have a count of the number of attempts that someone makes uh, for for all three players and we also have the actual responses we know how many times they buzz but we also know which clues they buzzed on at which level what i did there was to try and take those two things and match them up <laughs> and see how much overlap there is among players. One of the first questions that I wanted to get at was, are players good because they're good on the buzzer? Are they good because they know things that their opponents don't? Or is it both? Sometimes, or is it neither? <laughs> Sometimes. The way, to, the way to figure that out is not just to say, okay, look, we're going to see how the attempt numbers compare to each other. It's a really good first pass to say this person's attempting more than another one. They probably know more. They're, you know, they're trying, they're trying more. There's, there's more substance there to work with, um, to start with. It's, it's another iteration of the, like, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. At work, I like to follow up people who say this with the, the one in baseball that does not work, which is you miss a hundred percent of the swings that you don't take because sometimes you don't want to swing <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. and that's entirely reasonable. And sometimes in Jeopardy, you don't want to buzz, but the, the more times that you feel comfortable doing it, uh, if you have the right assessment of your own knowledge, that's a signal that you are probably working with a stronger knowledge base, or at least one that's more appropriate for the categories that are on the board during that round. There are some assumptions baked into the timing and solo numbers. Using those combinations, I make some assumptions and then apportion out probabilities for every clue on the board that a player is attempting on it. The assumptions there are that the probability should add up so that the number of attempts total in probability is equal to the number of attempts we actually know. It should be so that if there's something like a triple stumper where no one buzzes in, that we actually reflect that. It's zero. No one tried. And that generally things at the top of the board are more attempted on than things at the bottom of the board. If someone brings in with a correct response on a clue that someone earlier had an incorrect response on, they were probably attempting earlier, but it's not certain. So there's a little bonus on that, but it's not... 100 like it's not saying you were 100 percent coming in on that taking those probabilities which again are based on sets of assumptions as well as some assumptions of correlation among players to say you know we know podium one buzzed there's probabilities that podium two and podium three buzzed there's also individually but there's also a correlated probability of both two and three versus two or exclusively three versus neither. That is not exactly the same as those being independent. There are some assumptions into what the correlation is there that I just sort of made up as something that made numbers that I felt were nice. <laughs> that 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 fit with what my experience was. Not that I thought that they just like looked nice and I, I was pleased with the aesthetics of them, but that they, they matched with what I felt going on around me during actually playing. Using those, you can reach a number of that in the original form of the website, 
was actually very highly visible called expected buzz of given this assumed pattern of attempt probabilities uh, across there, how many buzzes should you actually have gotten? You attempted 20 times, you were overlapping with people this much. If we said just if there are two people buzzing in, you should get in half the time. And if there are three people buzzing in, you should get in a third of the time. Everyone has absolutely equal skill with the buzzer. Then how many times would you get in, in this like more random chance based on your knowledge fashion? Uh, and then compare it to the number of times that you actually get in. If you're, if that number of actual times is higher, you have a good timing score. If that number is lower, you have a bad timing score. And then we can also use those estimates to say how many of those times are you just the only one buzzing in that you should get in 100% of the time. And that's your solo score and reflects the broader knowledge base that you're working with. These are estimates. It's all model output and it's only vaguely a model to begin with, but they provide stuff that passes a smell test. They provide something that you can look at and say, hey, like this, this looks like what I saw in the game. Uh, and that can point me to places where it's not quite so obvious on watching the game to see what's going on underneath. The uh, attempt value, timing value, and solo value are an expanded version of that. Uh, one of the limitations of just using the raw numbers uh, of attempts and then a timing score based on number of buzzes and a solo score based on number of buzzes is that it doesn't reflect that the clues aren't worth the same and the rounds aren't worth the same. It is better to have more knowledge in double jeopardy than it is to have it in the jeopardy round. Mm -hmm. It is better to have, like, if you start the game bad on the buzzer, it's okay, you can pick it up. Double jeopardy is literally worth twice as much. People will often find their rhythm after the commercial break. The part before the commercial break is one sixth of the total value of the game. There are more valuable things happening later on. There are more valuable clues on the board. Uh, if you're playing alone at the board, that should be reflected in a better score. Um, and so the the value version of this treats the clues as weighted according to what their actual value on the board is, as opposed to just being a single point, so to speak, which allows better comparison game to game because if someone is very strong on the set of categories in the Jeopardy round and less strong in the double Jeopardy round versus someone who has that flipped, one of those people is going to have the better game. And it's the person who's stronger in double Jeopardy. The count-based scores will not reflect that, but the value-based scores will. And that's why I put more emphasis on those going forward. What about contention? How is that stat calculated? And what can it tell us about one game compared to another? I kind of de-emphasized contention because I wasn't sure anyone was... I, I wasn't sure how I was using it. Um, and it's sort of this odd thing that's not tied to one player. Um, and so... It's kind of gone away. I might bring it back. But the idea behind contention is that same idea that underlies solo. It's kind of the opposite of it. Given that you were buzzing in, given that anyone was buzzing in, were they blocking someone else? And that can give you a sense of how competitive a game is in terms of the buzzer game. Uh, we know how competitive it is in terms of the correctness and in terms of the score, but we don't have a good sense of how much it is behind the scenes. And even comparing the the attempt numbers isn't always clear. A game that is 27, 27, 27 on attempts in Double Jeopardy is going to be a highly contentious game. A game that is 15, 15, and 15 is not. Even though those numbers are the same, they're almost certainly coming on different clues. People are probably getting in very easily on the things that they're trying to ring in on, um, as opposed to as opposed to the knife fight. <laughs> version of it where everyone is trying to get in on ev everything that captures something that i think is better reflected on an individual basis but i'm I'm not i'm not entirely sure it's 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 ongoing gotcha so when zach goslin was on the show earlier this year i remember reading on his blog that as part of his preparation for the show he's a data analyst as well he sorted jeopardy categories into specific bins or subjects and he used that data to figure out what his strengths and weaknesses were is that something that you'd be interested in working on or implementing for geometry in the future? Could I say, let's say, compare how good Chris Pinuolo is next to Luigi de Guzman in science, for example, or wordplay categories based on their historical accuracy in those subjects? I, it is not something that I want to do right now because it's hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> Understandable. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it is. It is very hard. I do not generate any data that doesn't exist elsewhere at mm. the moment. And so if someone had a categorization of categories that would be that was easy to ingest and put in that would be something that would be really helpful 
Um, I do have some light hypotheses that are completely untestable because I don't have this data, but that I think really do come into play. Um, and particularly when you're talking about a head-to-head -head matchup like that, mm -hmm. um, they, they're important for how players play against each other. The ability for people to cover a wide range of categories is important for the idea that they can compete against a wider range of opponents. It's hard to get into how a head-to-head-to-head -head -to -head matchup would play out without having a sense of what the categories on the board are. Mm. Because otherwise, there there's a lot of variance in the game to begin with. Without knowing what the battlefield is, how can you predict the battle? <laughs> True. Uh, and, and it's something that's not in these metrics at all right now. Again, just because it's hard. I think that it's something where you would probably see definite strengths come out for people. Uh, I would be extremely interested in, even at a first pass, breaking out wordplay and vocabulary categories, which tend to play pretty differently. Players will be either very comfortable with them or they will be very not in the... Uh, unlike the more trivia-based categories that are more instantly know it or not know it uh, in terms of the decision making, and so a lot of the buzzing happens very quickly, wordplay categories tend to have some delay. Or they'll have someone who is confident enough in their ability to do wordplay that they'll buzz in before they figured it out and then spend the seconds ticking down doing the figuring it out and giving a response. And someone who is confident enough in that has a huge advantage over people who do not. I think it would be interesting to pick up. If you could ask the Jeopardata team to publish any more numbers than what's already available in the current box scores, what would you want them to publicize that would help to improve geometry? What I would absolutely love, <laughs> uh, first and foremost, is the log of attempts. I would like to have just the entire game trail of the game, of who was trying to buzz in, on which clue, on which time the clue was given, uh, if it was given up for a rebound. And not have to deal in probabilities <laughs> for those things anymore. That would, I think, be the the purest form of that data. If it came with the actual timing and how people were early or late, I think that would be really cool. But even just at the beginning, not just what the counts are, but how they match up to the board, I think would be what the, the next step would be. I don't know that they would ever do that. I'm not sure why they wouldn't. It just feels like it's something a little bit farther along. Uh, but then they've also talked about uh, in terms of like second screen broadcast or something like that of having something exactly like that. So why wouldn't they publish it? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, one thing's for sure. They definitely do have that technology. I mean, for those who don't know, who, for those listening who don't know, um, at the judges table, they have like a live feed, I believe, of like people ringing in or buzzing in live so they could see if you're being early or late. And Corinna at the commercial break will tell you if you're like, oh, you're ringing in too early or you're ringing in too late. So perhaps something like that in a more, I don't know if you necessarily want a video of that feed, but maybe like, like you said, a log of like when people ring in, like the milliseconds or whatever, when clues are asked, perhaps that would be useful. That's, that's the sort of thing I'm, I'm thinking of is given given a stream of clues. Um, it, it's, it's actually really, really, really analogous to baseball data. And of course, I think about this because it's what I do all the time. But the discrete nature of the game makes it as a sport a really good match for baseball. If you think about the clue as a pitch and you think about an attempt as a swing, these things actually really match up in terms of how you can think about how the statistics could work, not just at the, the level of counting, but also at the level of timing. The clue arrives, the, the lights go on, the buzzers are enabled, and where the, the swing, <laughs> quote, swing around that is, uh, whether it's before, whether it's after, when, when there are multiple attempts um, due to having been locked out, what that looks like, I think, would be really interesting. Now let's talk about the TOC, but I want to start in February 2021, immediately after your streak came to an end. Brian Chang and Zach Newkirk had recently finished their runs, and Matt Amodio was still a nobody, or more accurately, a PhD student at Yale. At that point, how did you feel about your chances of getting into the TOC, and how did that feeling change as people like Matt, Amy, Matea, and Ryan began appearing on TV. I think at some point you created a graph that documented the percent chance that you'd be invited to the TOC. Is that right? It is uh, because I decided to torture myself through math. When when I left the studio uh, after losing my my fifth game, Karina told me, "Hey, you know, 
there's an outside chance he'll be back here. It's four days. It's a pretty high total. It's not like a great chance, but it's an outside chance. You should you should consider this. And I was like, that's cool. I will uh, I will move on with my life with that consideration. <laughs> um, I can't build my life around that, but it is it is okay as a thing to to consider. And then it was another eighty games before anyone reached four wins. Oh, People that was when Courtney about, Shaw like went on her streak, was, right? That was with Courtney Shaw's seven game streak. Mm. And people think about this recent tournament as having been the time of super champions. But a good third of that time period, uh, which goes back to January of 2021, a third of that time period was really a time of no champions. For weeks, there was no one with greater than a two game streak. Uh, then there were a few threes. And it wasn't until Courtney, about four four and a half months after me, had a seven game streak that there was anyone who was even eligible again. Then shortly after her was Matt and then Jonathan and then then this whole train of people. Um, (laughs) And uh, at that point, I'd gone from thinking, oh, hey, like maybe, maybe this outside chance has gotten a lot larger to maybe this outside chance has actually gotten smaller. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Who who knows what is actually done? So I decided to put together a graph just so that I would have some sort of sanity in my own framing of the question based on j archive i had put together historical data on if you have a a one game winner how many times do they become a two game winner if you have a two game winner how many times do you become a three game winner if you have a three game winner how many times do you become a four game winner and when you look at the data mapped out like that it matches very well with the power law relationship so i just like made a curve and said this is what i'm going to assume (laughs) happens when there's a new champion just as we're coming down the line uh, i'll take the current champion the number of games that they have and give them based on that number of games a percent chance of winning that is based on this power law the defining feature of a power law relationship is that the longer something has been going on the more likely it is to continue so if you have a 20 game champion then the odds are pretty good they'll go on to be a 21 game champion if you have a one game champion you don't really have a lot of information on whether they'll become a two game champion or not using that just sort of basically mapped out what the year <laughs> looked like um and then past past where the current champion would lose just say like well now we're just creating random people you can kind of assume at this point that given this amount of time and this relationship here's how many four plus game winners should show up in that time with with these four probabilities just fact tack that on to the end and uh and we'll see where it goes and when I first made it, it was in the middle of Amy's streak, which was really right after Amy won her fourth game with a higher total than I had, was the lowest at that point that I had been, even lower than when I left the studio uh, after losing. At about what that model said, and again, there's no way of knowing if this is correct or not, uh, but <laughs> what that model said as being about a one in eight chance. Then as she won a bunch of games, it said, oh, hey, she's just going to keep winning. Probably not forever, but for a while. So for as long as she keeps winning, like chances keep getting better. That's good. Mm. Uh, Then she lost and it dropped again because now there's more time that she's not eating up games that are going to be available for someone else to qualify. So then it dropped down again. It rose actually a lot. Uh, One of the things that I liked about it was that it was very, very insensitive to the number of people who weren't qualifying right after me. There was a rise, but it was very gradual, looking at sort of the post-prediction on that. But that by the time we were around to spring 2022, it would rise very, very quickly. Uh, It was very sensitive to the idea that I was right on the cusp. With an additional champion qualifying, I would be much less likely to make it. But every time someone would lose just short, Uh, I'd get a huge boost as like time had come off of the board, uh, running out the clock. It went from about one in eight when I left a lot in February to as high as it was about 60% at the point where Matt's like after Matt's 38th win, (laughs) it was about 60%. uh, And then dropped when Jonathan beat him and then dropped some more when Jonathan lost. And, you know, just like, ugh. It went back all the way down to like this 12, 13 percent just after Amy's qualification. It reached back up to 60 percent right after that 
was i believe ryan was the next one to qualify eric and megan were after that and by that time during ryan's streak it had like fallen all the way down and i was just like yeah i'm gonna ignore that this is a possibility at this point because i'm not gonna i'm not gonna pay attention to a five percent probability of making a tournament but at that point is when they texted me and said hey we want you to come for the tournament please save these dates and at that point i thought oh is ryan is Ryan going to just win out for the rest of this? Season? <laughs> is that what's happening? Because I don't think that's what's happening because one of the things that the data is telling me is that, you know, he's good, but he's not like 40 game streak good. This would be a surprising outcome with a lot of chance involved. And then, no, it wasn't that. It was that the threshold had moved and there were going to be 21 of us instead of 15. All the four game winners were going to make it. So all of the probabilities, like given given what the tournament structure ended up being, it was actually 100% from the time yeah. that I walked off the <laughs> I was studio. About to say. <laughs> um, I guess if there had been a lot more four game winners, it would have been different. But I was high mm. enough up on the four game winners that... Um, I had different versions of the graph because no one really knew how second chance was going to work, how many tournaments there would be um, for your for your college championship. Originally, players from that weren't going to make the tournament when it was a team championship, but then it became an individual championship, and they were. And there were just like new new slots being given away, and it was like, oh no, these are all ruining my chances. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then when it became clear that there were going to be more slots. I didn't publish this because I couldn't tell people that I knew there were going to be more slots, but I made some assumptions of, I think that what we're talking about is my guess, my guess was probably 18 people qualifying from regular play, which I think turned out to be what it was. Maybe I made no 17. Yeah. I picked out 17. They'd announced there'd be two second chances at that point, mm. or at least they had told me one of the two, but I knew, I knew it was a top 17. I knew that even though I'd been told I was going to make it, the probability that I was in the top 17 of the leaderboard was much, much higher than the probability that I was in the top 12, which is what I had needed before. The probability I was in the top 12 was basically zero. The probability that I was going to be in the top 17 was basically 100%. It was like 99.8 or something like that at that point. Jackie's was not quite certain either, but hers was, hers I needed to like, lengthen the column width so that i could actually see all of the nines in it before excel rounded it up <laughs> <laughs> yeah because you uh, and jackie were close in terms of final winnings right i think you ended yeah, up being the highest four-day winner right no she's higher than me she's, oh, she's higher, higher than, than me, me by about by about twelve thousand uh, dollars but what i was curious about was knowing who was going to be qualifying under and maureen's probability bounced around a lot because at that threshold she was the one that was on the bubble ultimately making it because i mean by the time they told us i got in retrospect i got texted on the day after the last tape day of the season so they knew who had qualified it wasn't a question of oh are we going to have 17 are we going to leave any of the four game winners out they absolutely knew that that was all that was all the people they had the full set there was no further qualification possible i did not know that <laughs> i i was still at this point, it had just become part of my daily routine. So it was like, oh, you know, here's a, you know, here's another person with a long streak. Let's just add it in, see what the graph says. Oh, still zero. You know, like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So as your graph went up and down and up and down, when did you start like preparing for the TOC? Because like Zach, you were one of the few people who had over a year to study. I, quite honestly, I don't think I did any any studying in the way that people think of it as preparation for the TOC. In terms of subject matter, the one thing I really did was directly was to make some flashcards about operas just so that any operas that I had heard of and any composers I had heard of, I knew how those matched up. Like I wasn't going to learn about the characters if I didn't already know them, if I wasn't going to learn about plots or like settings or anything like that but i i would i could at least match up things that i already knew in in a better sense and it seemed like a thing that was the most likely thing to come up that i could reasonably improve on versus the whole sum of everything that there is to know about trivia beyond that i it was really about paying attention over the course of a year and a half with a mind of oh that is a thing that might come up that's a thing i should learn um, when you encounter something new, being intentional about paying attention to it and being open to learning about things that you wouldn't otherwise. 
uh, I guess I wouldn't say that I studied art or that I studied music. Those are going to be weak categories for me regardless. And maybe I could have done more <laughs> to improve in those. But what I did do is in playing other trivia through Learned League or through Alex Jacobs School of Trivia or you know anything else, when those things came up and I inevitably failed on them, at least like reading through and thinking through a little bit of what I had missed and asking myself, is this something I think I need to know? And if so, you know, just bringing it into a rotation of something that I would think about from time to time. There are only so many times that I can embarrassingly miss artist questions that are entirely obvious uh, before they sink in. You know, I did inevitably learn that Jasper Johns played paints flags and maps. I should know that. I like flags and maps. A guy who's going to paint them should be my favorite artist. <laughs> uh, I, should, I should remember that. But it, you know, it took it took years. <laughs> mm. Beyond that, I think I think the thing that the data helped me with was just being very intentional in how I thought about the game as well. It is not a straight trivia contest. Uh, if it were, I would lose to at least at the tournament level. I don't think that there's a ton of question <laughs> in that compared to the the people with wider knowledge bases than I have. Um, but when you're coming in from that point of relative weakness, then you can make up for it with intentionality, with strategy in the places where it's available to you. While I don't think that there's anything, there's no silver bullet in the data. There's no silver bullet in analytics in general as to what you should do. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does shape the way that you think about things and it does shape the way that you approach the problem. So that two things happen. One is I have thought about Jeopardy a lot <laughs> mm -hmm. over the course of a year and a half. And that meant that when I came there, it was with a different, not necessarily a different strategy, but with a different, a different approach to strategy to start with, a different way of thinking through what was happening in the game and when to think about this is bad this is good <laughs> how should i be reacting to this what's important in wagering what's important in clue selection when is it important to guess or not when is it okay when when should you hold back and when when i was doing when i was playing along at home that sort of question was the thing that i was actually practicing on mm. um you're not going to gauge how well you can actually do from home all of the time the boards change every day the categories are different the questions are different you'll have good games you'll have bad games what i really emphasized was looking back after a game and there were things i got right and that's fine there would be things that i would get wrong and it would say is this a good wrong or a bad wrong uh, but then there would be things that i would pass and that was the real question. Is this a good pass or a bad pass? Minimizing the bad passes where you're sitting there on an answer that you should feel more sure of. Learning to gauge my own assuredness, um, I think really helped going into the tournament and just mm. having that experience of knowing what it feels like to feel unsure and to come back and say, I've had to gauge this. I've had to work on this. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to try this better this time. So that, like I said, that intentionality in coming to it, I think, was a was a big difference. So in addition to intentionality and assuredness, uh, how else can future contestants use geometry in the same way that it benefited you? I think that a daily contact with the game and thinking through the different ways that people play it helps. I think it helps for confidence in how you approach the game and how you approach it mentally. Uh, I will say when I got back for the tournament, I felt basically no anxiety. There was a little bit immediately beforehand at home uh, but when i got to rehearsal and i stood at the podium looking at the board it just felt like oh this is the thing i've been thinking about for forever <laughs> uh, i've been here before i'm coming here in a better place i feel better being here i know more about myself uh, the more self-knowledge i have the better i'm going to feel and so that really worked for me if self-knowledge doesn't help you then then i don't know <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I think that one of the lessons of working with the data is that there are different key elements to being a Jeopardy! champion. Different players that we think are good are good at different ones. And even champions that we don't necessarily think of being particularly good are also good at some of these things. There are players who don't win who have good games, and it's, there's just a, a lot of chance involved in it. And it's okay. The The data is littered with players who are on a, not, not maybe not the level of like the super champions, but at the level of people who qualify for the tournament who won three games instead or two or one or zero. There's not a lot that you can do about that. <laughs> um, 
and understanding that that the game takes place outside of yourself uh, to a very large extent you can only control the things that you like that you do it helps to go into a game knowing like hey like i really do have a one in three chance of winning the expected outcome is i lose that's okay so long as i put up a game that I can look at afterwards because I'm going to be looking at it because <laughs> it's going to show up in the data and I'm going to be obsessive about myself because that's the way that this works. So long as I put up something that I can look at and be satisfied with, then then that's going to be fine. So you went up against Courtney and Rowan in your quarterfinal match and Matt and Sam in your semifinal match. Uh, once you knew who you'd be facing, did your gameplay strategy change at all or did you change anything about your play in reaction to those matchups or not really? I don't think that there's anything that I could do that would really change. At that point, you know that you're going to be playing against people who are going to be actively seeking daily doubles, which is really the largest single change that there can be from one opponent to another is how much they do that. In terms of in terms of what you can control for, if someone knows more than you, there's not really anything you can do to combat that, so to speak. They're just going to know more than you. If someone is going to be hunting for daily doubles more than you, you can adjust that. You can hunt more in return. Uh, and uh, that that is a thing that you can adjust is your clue selection. Taking into account where they might appear on the board, what categories they've already been in, what subject matter they're more likely to be in. Those are things that you can adjust, but they're not really... They're things that in regular play, you might encounter an opponent who, who is doing that and you'd go, oh, you know, I need to step up here. But coming into the tournament, you should just assume that. <laughs> mm, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I need every edge. I'm going to step up to start with. I, I will be the one that must be stepped up to. And everyone has to do that as a result. I do know that some people don't like that style of play. Mm. Um, it is harder to follow at home. And that is coming from someone who plays that way <laughs> when necessary. <laughs> um, and specifically trained myself to better be able to follow a game that follows that pattern. Uh, because it was going to be necessary. There's an element of me that says, you know, that's kind of deal with it. <laughs> Get good. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's not, that's not entirely fair. It is both a game that people play and also a spectator sport. And, you know, you want it to be good for the spectators as well. I think that what is on display is different than it might have been a decade ago, two decades ago. But it is still something that is extremely worth watching and extremely impressive. I'm not talking about myself here, <laughs> but but when you watch people who do this at at such a high caliber, the things that they know and the the ability to context switch from one thing to another very quickly, that's really hard. And that's what makes it hard to follow at home, but it should make it all the more amazing when you see people do it on screen at the speed that they're doing it. Mm. Uh, was there a specific gratifying moment in either your quarterfinal match or semifinal match that you can credit to geometry? Perhaps something to attest to that assuredness or the assuredness you were talking about? The thing that was most shaped by working with the data uh, was the daily double way train. So this is from the quarterfinal. Looking back at my original run, I came away with the feeling that I did not wager particularly well on daily doubles. Uh, and it's a hard problem. There's a lot of variability in the game when the daily double happens. Final Jeopardy, I'm very comfortable with. Uh, with the wagering strategy there but daily doubles you get so much less time <laughs> you don't get anything to write on and you're dealing with a lot of unknowns in terms of where the game can go afterwards that it's hard hard to know what to do about three weeks before the tournament i started isolating at home so that i would not be exposed to to covid beforehand and so during the time when I was just at home, <laughs> uh, I thought to myself, you know, I need to, I need to get a better handle on what, what this means. I, it's something that I had known that I needed to get to for most of the time that was there, but working out what an optimal daily double wager relies on having a good idea of what a win probability model looks like for a game as a whole to start with. And then being able to predict what your opponents are going to be good at based on what's still on the board. And it changes a lot based on, is this the last daily double? That's the easiest one. Is it the second last? That one's kind of difficult. Is it the first one? You shouldn't even bother trying for optimal strategy at that point. You should just do 
like in terms of the tactics you should do something strategic that doesn't really depend on the game situation at that point because there's so little information in the jeopardy round about how the game will evolve that you might as like you you should just do something (laughs) do something that works for you i'm not the only one to have come to this conclusion this is really what's behind andrew's all in all the time strategy recognizing that that is not always going to be optimal but it's going to be more optimal than something that you come up with in the moment while you're standing there panicking so what i did do was reduce the problem and reduce the problem and reduce the problem some more to the the lowest the lowest form that i could which was to say, what if I am selecting the last clue of Double Jeopardy and it's the Daily Double and one of my opponents is in the negative and doesn't matter. (laughs) So it's a two-person game. I have the last Daily Double and this is the only thing that is happening besides Final Jeopardy for the rest of the game. What should happen then? What matters in, in assessing this situation? And the things that matter are, what are the scores? obviously how do they relate to each other uh both in like in in the ratio uh of them so that you can get into a lock game so that you can get out of a lock game you can get into crush you can get a lead whatever is actually necessary there how confident do you feel in the category itself and how do you feel about final jeopardy at this point you don't know what the final jeopardy category will be but you have at least a game's worth of information about your opponent and whether or not they're like you. One thing that I do in Learned League when I do defense is, for those of you who don't know, in Learned League, you play against one opponent and you assign basically difficulty of question on how likely you think your opponent is to answer the same questions that you're answering. And you get stats on how they do in categories. And to some extent that's useful, but what I use it for broadly as a heuristic is, how much is this person like me and how much is this person not like me? How correlated are we? That tells me in particular are they an art and music person uh should i should i be flipping what i've done i can have a sense of what is like if it's a really hard geography question i will recognize it's a really hard geography question but if it's a medium geography question then someone who doesn't do well with the category i can't tell (laughs) that that's going to be hard for them uh and so this idea of me versus anti-me this correlation factor is something that i use there pretty frequently and that i'm comfortable with and that comes into play in final jeopardy as well what matters is a lot less of how confident you are in final jeopardy overall and more about how much you think you match with someone particularly in the mid ranges where wagering is interesting these are the 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 differences that change uh, what you should do for strategy when you're in between bot games and they make a difference in whether or not being in the lead is a big deal or not if you think that you're very like someone then it's more important to be in the lead if you think you're very unlike someone then it's a lot less important to be in the lead within the bounds of like not being crushed but if if you think that you're going to if you think that you're going to do final jeopardy the same way and that you're both probably good at final jeopardy you desperately want to lead but if you don't think either of those things then that threshold of having the same score is just not as important as the other thresholds around it and so i did a lot of situations and just like given given this situation of last clue daily double and different confidences and different correlation factors what do these look like and on the whole it turned out that in general if you are more confident in getting the daily double right now if it's in a category that you like or if it's just the fact that it's a clue on the board at all, they're generally easier than Final Jeopardy, it's worth it to capitalize it, capitalize on it at that last moment. Going for the high leverage play now rather than holding the powder dry, hoping for a better Final Jeopardy is worth it. Uh, And that you should be going for the the wagers that put you up by 1.5, that put you up by double. So long as you're not overly risking locking yourself out, then go for it and even sometimes if you are risking locking yourself out that can still be very worth it um and then you back that up and say well the 29th clue of the round is going to be basically the same as the 30th and the 28th clue of the round is going to be basically same as the 29th and you sort of back this out into that same idea of these wagers are larger than my intuition was originally so when we came to the the first daily double and double jeopardy of my quarterfinal i have 
a lead. It's a, a modest lead, but it, it exists. Uh, but it is enough of one that if I... I can actually pull up <laughs> pull up my own game right here. Hold on. So at the time that the Daily Double comes up, I'm hovering just above one and a half times Rowan's score. And the wager puts it up to two and a half times, which given the expected amount of the game, there's still a Daily Double out there. Um, but given the other 15 clues that are out there, starting out from two and a half times is going to be probably enough given that we've been roughly even through the game as a whole. That will naturally tighten if you're up. If you're trying to be up by double on your opponent, uh, you have to score twice as much of them as they do in order to maintain the same ratio. Um, so if you're playing fairly even, there will be a natural tightening as the game progresses. Um, but I do think that in general, each board sort of finds its own equilibrium of if you played this set of categories for an infinite amount of time, <laughs> then you would you would reach the ratio that the three contestants would, would have of the amount that they're getting off of those boards. So it, that wager is made to say, I want to get above double row and score. But beyond that, because half of the round is still left, I want to get past more than double their score. But it's not worth it at least in my evaluation, to chance going below half their score. There's always a chance that the categories for the rest of the game will, will be more to their strengths, and that just leaves me in a position to get locked out. It's not worth crossing that threshold to me at that point. Also, it was in geography. This is the strongest category I have. I'd already done <laughs> the rest of the category successfully, uh, so it felt like a good thing to go in on. The very next clue is another daily double. Um, this one is less important to get big and more important to to go through that same thought exercise though of what is the thing that you're going for here and the thing that you're going for at this point is this is the last one there's still half a game left but the wager here makes it nearly triple the score there's not really a reasonable amount of tightening that can happen without a daily double at that point provided that there's not a an outright collapse in the way that i'm playing and if that happens then you know you deserve to lose <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that, that's, that's what went into that. But the, the idea that I'd be wagering that much money on trivia, it's kind of like, that's what the point of the game is. <laughs> uh, but it's not often what people actually do and training yourself out of that, um, takes practice. It takes work. It takes looking at numbers and saying like, oh yeah, no, this is actually how I want to approach the problem. And then practicing that. Gotcha. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of how the, the thing you mentioned about tightening it reminds me of how, I don't know which game it was, but during the TOC finals when Andrew would double up, but then immediately after he doubles up, Amy goes on like a streak of like correct responses. And then suddenly that two times lead that you were alluding to suddenly becomes closer to one or possibly less and like Amy takes the lead. So the first game I have in front of me is the fourth game of the TOC finals between Amy, Andrew and Sam. It was the game where Andrew couldn't find his buzzer timing in spite of attempting to buzz in on the same number of clues as Amy, 47. Granted, it was the first game of a taping day, and the three of them had just played three finals games the day before, so I think it's safe to say that Andrew just needed a warm-up game. Uh, Actually, this was the second day, game of that tape day. Oh, is it? The The Wednesday tape day was three semifinals and two finals. Ah, oh, I and see. And then the Thursday tape day was the remainder of the finals, so there were... Uh, four games taped that day this was the second one. gotcha i was under the impression the first three games were filmed that after the semifinals had taped i guess that changes the context what do you think happened in that game if it was the second tape day or the second game of the tape day rather i think that there's actually a lot of possibility that timing comes and goes <laughs> um i don't have a good answer for you in terms of the context there it is it's a mystery mm -hmm. um there will be times where you feel great and you get in and it is, it is all good. And then it disappears and you're left wondering why while you're still playing a game of Jeopardy. And there doesn't really seem to be rhyme or reason to it. I know that the, the, best, the best I've ever felt in terms of the timing on the buzzer was the remainder of the game after in, in the quarterfinal after having secured most of the win already. Uh, and it's like, well, you know, like this is this is great, but like I could have used this some other time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but also I think that that contextually makes a lot of sense 
in that the game was nearly entirely one to begin with. It's hard to know what's going on in Courtney's mind or in Rowan's mind. The level of focus at that point might be different between the players. And so it might make sense that that happens. Or it could also be a, a bit, you know, post hoc reasoning here that part of the reason I was in that position was because like my timing had improved during the break to begin with between Jeopardy and Double Jeopardy or that I was more confident about the categories or, you know, something. And then that ended up in the Daily Double uh, pair and then that led to the rest of the game the, you know, these things feed back on each other and and we just don't know i do know that andrew said he felt off during this fourth final game he actually asked me specifically about this a few weeks ago um, after it aired about like just just how bad <laughs> how bad was <laughs> how bad it, was it? <laughs> um and coming back to him and uh, i don't I don't mind saying this. It seems mean, but he he actually has been telling his friends um, this, uh, but that it was quite literally a zeroth percentile performance on the buzzer. Oof. Uh, not not just of the tournament, but of like anything that we have data for. <laughs> um, it was it was just really bad. And he he's like, yeah. Well, I mean, I thought so. Something felt bad. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, something felt bad in this game specifically. He doesn't really know what, I don't know what, uh, but it's there mm. to say, like, he's not getting in, he's trying, it's not happening. Um, and it makes a huge difference in the game. So if I'm interpreting the tables in front of me correctly, we can see that Andrew's lack of buzzer precision prevented him from answering seven to eight clues, and he missed out on about $8,800 worth of extra opportunities to answer. Would that be a, a good way to describe it? Yes, versus what you'd expect if they were all having like a normal person's normal time on the buzzer, mm. uh, all the all kind of the same, all like like I talked about earlier, the idea that if all three of them are buzzing in, which is the case a lot of the time in this game, because mm -hmm. uh, the attempts are 47, 47, and 50, these are all high end of the bell curve kinds of numbers. If all three of them are getting in, you'd expect each of them to get in about a third of the time, and that is not what we see. Yeah, yeah, because his attempt value, Andrew's attempt value is in line with Amy and Sam's at around 42,000. Yes. So they're like almost exactly, like you said, buzzing on the same clues, having overlap. At the end of Double Jeopardy, Andrew went into final in a distant third with 6,800, while Amy led with 25K, followed by Sam with 20K. And I picked this game specifically because I think it's the most contentious one in the TOC uh, with both the Jeopardy round and Double Jeopardy round, I believe. I don't know if it shows the contention, contention rates anymore, but my notes say that on average it was about 80%. And it was actually 94% Double I'll Jeopardy. I'll look it up for you here. I have that in my back end. Okay, yeah. So I have the Jeopardy round contention at 83% and mm -hmm. the Double Jeopardy round contention at 94%. Mm -hmm. uh, again, contention in this case says what number of times that someone buzzes uh, with a correct answer are they blocking someone who is attempting to buzz and might have a correct answer. Those are both really high. <laughs> um, yeah. you, the, the distribution for regular play uh, is centered somewhere around 70 in the Jeopardy round and maybe more like 65 in Double Jeopardy. So having it be 83 and 94 and having it be higher in Double Jeopardy is, is an unusually high mm. <laughs> contention rate for the game. Uh, is there any other context from this game that I might be leaving out other than, you know, the overall sentiment that Andrew just wasn't good in the buzzer and we can see that through the attempt value and uh, the contention rate? I would say that the the other thing that's really reflected in here is I think there's a change in gameplay for Amy over the course of the finals where she starts out playing much the way that she did during her 40 game run. Which makes a lot of sense. I mean, mm. <laughs> it's incredibly successful. She's very good. But that she becomes much more aggressive over the course of the final as it becomes clear that that's what's necessary. Looking at the the scoring through the lens of like what should the wagering be when she gets a, a daily double uh, about two-thirds of the way through the game, uh, she makes a wager that is pretty typical for her of 4,000 that really needs to be larger given the game situation. Uh, because it really barely moves the needle between her and Sam at this point. And there's still not a lot of value on the board, but there's enough that a bigger wager would make the game more certain. She ends up wagering to where afterwards she's 1.25 times his score. And that's that's the same as being just barely in the lead. 
when you reach the end of the game. And that's actually the ratio she ends up at at the end, which means that Final Jeopardy is less advantageous to her than if she'd gotten to 1.5 times, uh, which was well within her reach. She just had to make the bigger wager. I haven't sat and done this to figure out if she still had been okay on the other side, um, but I think she probably would have with a, with a slightly... With a, with a large enough wager to get there. Um, although, you know what? Maybe not. They were tied at the time. That's tough. That's the other thing that I would take away from it is um, looking at it with less of an eye towards the raw scores and more of how the ratio of scores puts you in line for final jeopardy. Also helps clarify what the wagering should be. And that is a wager, I think, that later in the tournament, even even just two games later, is larger for her than it is during this game. So the next two games I want to break down are Chris Panulo's 11th and 15th games. And I chose these two because they do a great job at quantifying Chris's buzzer prowess and his knowledge. So on October 14th, Chris's last game before the second chance competition, he went up against Rhiannon Thomas and Marianne Dos Santos. Chris and Marianne attempted the same number of clues at 45. So at first glance, you would think maybe this would be a close game. But Chris's reflexes made all the difference. His buzz percentage was 76%, while Marianne's was only 27%. And through buzzer timing, Chris picked up 12 to 13 more clues and more than $11,000 in extra opportunities to answer. Meanwhile, Marianne missed out on 8 to 9 clues and over 9,700 because she got pipped on the buzzer by Chris. And we can assume most of Marianne's buzzer battles were with Chris based on the fact that not only were their attempts equal, but their attempt values were nearly equal as well, around 38k. John, if you have this game up, is there anything else from here that looks interesting to you? Yeah, I I think this game is a really good example of the way that I think about making money on Jeopardy (laughs) (laughs) is that you start from how much are you trying to get in on? There's a, a conversion. This is why this is why these tabs are now labeled conversion. Mm. Uh, is that there is a conversion of how much are you attempting on that you actually get in on, and then how much do you get in on that you turn into money positively. On the count side, this is attempt to buzz to correct buzzes. On the value side, it's attempt value, buzz value, and then buzz score. Uh, and then daily doubles are sort of like out here on the side popping in to to provide variance wherever possible. Although in in Chris's games in general, he's getting enough correct that he's also getting all the daily doubles. And then, you know, the variance is is being put to bed. Marianne is struggling with the conversion of attempting to buzzing. That 80% to 22% is, is striking. Effectively is giving Chris access to two extra categories in, da- in, in double jeopardy, the equivalent of just being on his own on the board. <laughs> for a third of a round is is an advantage that he's gaining through that timing. Uh, but also the conversion of when you do get in, what are you able to do with it? And in this game, Chris answers 100% of things that he buzzes in on correctly. Chris is not always at 100%, but it's always very close. And in particular for, for value, he tends, when he does miss, it tends to be on low value clues in the first round. Maybe feeling things out, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but it does tend to be very high on on that on that secondary part as well. And so the overall pipeline of making money on Jeopardy is the combination of those two things plus daily doubles. Marianne is struggling on both of those. She's only getting in 22% of the time that she's trying, but then she's also like the value of the, what she gets in on is 8,400, but off of that, she only makes 3,200 because of a large number of misses, particularly in double Jeopardy. Uh, and it, when I say a large number, that doesn't necessarily mean, strictly speaking, that it is actually a large number. She gets in all told in terms of number on 12 clues, and she answers nine of them correctly. But those three really do a lot of damage. Mm-hmm. Uh, because when the first half of the fight is to just get in on the buzzer to begin with, if you're then wrong, then you not only lose the negative money or gain the negative, you not only lose (laughs) money from being wrong and taking the penalty for it, but there's also the opportunity cost that one of the times that you won the buzzer race is now gone. That's money that you can't earn anymore. It comes off of, off of that possibility and that someone else can now pick up. And 
that really really hammers into what she she's doing to the point where she barely comes out positive for double jeopardy at all i think what happens there and this is not to not to fault her because i think that what probably happens here is that she's behind uh it's clear at the end of the jeopardy round that um that both Rhiannon and Marianne are behind, that this is a rear guard action. You do what you have to. And that means taking more risks in double jeopardy, mm. going for it, trying to get in, uh, taking chances on things that you might know rather than things that you know that you do know. And eating it when you're wrong is absolutely the right move here because there's no other way to catch up. Passing is not an option when you're down by this much. In the end, at one point, Chris is up by like 11 times the nearest score mm. and he ends up at about seven times in order to deal with that you have to take a lot of risk and that's what she's doing and i think that that's again a perfectly reasonable expected proper thing to do but it does result in like a hard time when those risks don't pan out mm. you're in a position where they have to and they don't and you just end up in an even worse position mm -hmm. it's tough but that's the way that double jeopardy works a lot of the time and buzzer timing isn't the only thing Chris uh, has got going for him. His breadth and depth of knowledge are very impressive, which has actually surprised Ken on a few times during his run so far. Take Chris's 15th game on November 25th, for example. He had the most attempts of the game at 48, which already implies, as we discussed earlier, he knows more than his opponents, most likely. And in this game, Sam Papua and Holly Smith hovered around 30 attempts each. As you'd expect, Chris's buzz percentage was high at 75%, and while he did manage to scoop up about $5,700 worth of extra opportunities through buzzer timing, this 75% is mostly because he went uncontested in most of his buzzes. Chris tends to do well in the Jeopardy round because of his buzzer timing, but Double Jeopardy is where he thrives. In this game, he picked up about $12,500 worth of extra opportunities to answer because he was the only one who buzzed in. With all that being said, is there anything else about Chris or his stats that might also be important to mention, John? I think overall, when you talk about that broad knowledge base, um, Chris is, in, in the number of attempts, Chris is always in the mid to high 40s. When you get into that number of attempts, when you get into the, the value of of those attempts just to start with um, and how that might reflect on on a knowledge base the the only people who are comparable are amy uh who also was always in the uh mid 40s she doesn't have quite the same peak but she also doesn't have quite the same floor this is at a pretty high variance point where the extra extra attempts are definitely coming from high value clues because that's all that's left on the board to be extra attempted for. Amy is is more consistent within this very narrow band, uh, but Chris has got the same coverage and is is always covering it as well. And then the only other person with you know a fair number of games who who is in that same realm is Luigi de Guzman, who actually averages around 50 attempts per game. But the difference is that Amy and Chris, uh, again, with that con that one conversion of uh, attempts to buzzes do better than Luigi does on that. Uh, Luigi comes out to a, roughly the same number of buzzes and then will also miss more of those than Amy or Chris do, uh, which is, you know, variance aside, um, even uh, if you go look at like Andy Saunders numbers, he has Chris as it's like 92, 93% to win an individual game at this point. Mm -hmm. um, that's still seven or eight percent to lose. That's not a small number mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the number of times that we've seen him play. You might have expected him to lose already. Yeah, he had several close calls earlier this week. But even even just like a twenty game set, if someone is going to lose seven or eight percent of the games that they play, out of twenty games, they probably lose one. Mm -hmm. That's that's just math. <laughs> that's <laughs> probability. Amy would have a similar number. Uh, in terms of the probability and the idea, Matt as well, the idea that you end up with a streak that is longer than that is in part due to chance or in part something we don't understand about modeling uh, or both, you know, who knows. And one thing I think that I know I saw some people online start talking about was that with the publication of box scores and with the advent of the second chance competition and... Um, the way that production would talk about who they were selecting and what went into those decisions. Like maybe people would just attempt all of the time <laughs> in, 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 in an attempt, uh, like in an overall attempt to, to boost those numbers and say like, hey, put me in second chance. Like, you know, I, I would have done well, but, you know, I just 
wasn't giving in. But I think that the way the game is structured is that you're going to get exposed. Um, <laughs> True. <laughs> if you if you are trying on everything uh, and you are not able to deal with that, then you will be <laughs> you will be shown that that happens because that negative penalty is just so strong. It is not something that I worry about. And mm-hmm. and that comparison, uh, this again, this is not directly about the game that we're talking about here. Yeah. Uh, but that comparison of of that strong knowledge base for Chris. For Amy, if you had someone who was like Luigi, attempting a lot, but not as strong at ac- as actually answering, you wouldn't see that person win any games. Mm. Yeah. So it's not it's not something you should worry about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I doubt somebody would come in with the intentions of qualifying for the second chance tournament over actually winning a game of Jeopardy. I think that's very uh, very strange if you had that intention going in. Well, it, it's it's sort of like. If you thought that you weren't going to win anyway, then maybe you should go for it. Like if you came mm. in and saw that you were going to play a twenty game winner, like maybe, mm. maybe you would do that. But I think actually we we now have uh, very specific evidence of this, uh, which we did not back when when these things were filming when they were first announced. Uh, but from the exhibition game during the tournament, we know that Matt was basically just trying to get in on everything, whether he knew it or not, because he was trying to to work on timing. He was treating it as a rehearsal and his score reflects that he was getting in and not exercising the same judgment of when to buzz as he would during an actual game and i mean he's still matt amodio (laughs) it's still (laughs) it's still gonna be pretty good uh but you know overall for that game he lost two hundred dollars on the buzzer so (laughs) only two hundred i thought it was more (laughs) well overall like oh overall over overall, I, I don't use core yet uh, because it wasn't computable from the box scores originally, which were the only data source at that point. His overall core yet, excluding the two daily doubles that he that he had, was negative two hundred. And that actually, when I was looking at his his page of statistics to begin with, uh, I was like, oh, what's that game? Uh, and and it turned out that that it was the exhibition <laughs> where he didn't care. Yeah, I think we can conclude here after our, our discussion about Chris is that he's not unbeatable, and I think the person who does go on to defeat him will do it in the same fashion previous giant killers have done in their games against super champs, going big on or at least denying their opponents the daily doubles and getting final Jeopardy right. Unless, of course, you're a Marine who defeated Margaret in a double stumper final Jeopardy clue, or Lance, in fact, who ended John's run after a triple stumper, which was, I was surprised because I was going through J Archive and I was trying to figure out when the last time a giant killer won on a triple stumper was. And I ended up landing on your uh, game five, which was <laughs> surprising. And I was like, oh, wow, what a coincidence. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, most often when super champs lose, uh, they do it from the lead in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I was not, I was in second. Um, that was, uh, that was a tough game. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. That's very, very pleasurable. No, I'm sorry, John. I just had to. <laughs> no, he, he really, it, it's fine. Uh, you know, I've had more than enough time to get over that and I've you know done better since then. I remember that being a very pop culture heavy game. I don't track exactly what I follow him on Twitter, but he talks a lot about film because that's what he studies. And so I, I'm not going to get his position exactly right. Uh, whether he's a student or an adjunct or or something like that, it's it's somewhere in there of both teaching and maybe having classes at this point. But it's all film, and he's very involved in pop culture. And the more of that that comes up, uh, the more tilted that was going to be towards him. And he was really good with timing, mm. uh, and I was really tired. So <laughs> oh yeah, is... wait, did you film all of your run in like one tape day or did you have to Yes, it was oh, it wow. was a Monday to Friday stretch. Sheesh. Um and you know, I think if he had come up at another time that week, maybe I would have beaten him, maybe I would have been a 5-day champion. Maybe in another orientation I would have lost to uh someone else. I could have lost to Morgan on the second day. I could have lost to Stan or Kate on the fourth day. There's a lot that just goes on with the individual match. I was in second place going into final on the fourth game mm. as well. Um, I very nearly was not talking with you about this because mm. I would not have been interested. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I would have, I would have known I was done. And so there, there's a lot of small chances along the way. And that's what I think makes the show compelling to watch 
is that you can have a good idea of what can happen, but it's still going to surprise you a lot of the time. Last question for you, John, and it's actually unrelated to stats and geometry. On October 17th, you tweeted a thread about a scare that happened the day of the Jeopardy honor ceremony. If you don't mind me asking, could you tell us about it and what happened afterwards? Uh, The day of the Jeopardy honor ceremony uh, was also the day that we were recording podcast interviews, promotional materials. We were doing our rehearsal. So we were going through hair and makeup for the first time, getting wardrobe checks. Um, If you've gone to a tape day as a contestant before, it's all the stuff that happens in the morning before the episodes air, uh, plus more stuff if you're if you were doing a very special tape day, uh, which being the tournament it was. We were allowed to keep our phones on us during this time. Uh, so you may have seen people post photos from <laughs> the uh, from the set, not normally allowed. That meant that I had my phone on me while waiting in line to do the podcast interview. My mom and my grandmother had been in a car accident. They had driven out from El Paso uh, to come to Los Angeles to come to the taping. Tournament of Champion contestants were allowed guests, uh, a limited number of guests, but guests nonetheless, which for all of us except for Zach was like this new thing uh, because none of us had ever played in front of people at all, let alone anyone (laughs) that cared about us. They were staying near Culver City, but they had driven up to Pasadena to visit my cousin and in the process got into something more than a fender bender, but something less than like rendering the car undrivable and everyone was fine everyone was okay but the car needed to be looked at to make sure that on the drive that was going to come up from los angeles back to texas uh that like the bumper wouldn't fall off on interstate 10 or something like Mm. that uh and make sure that that everything was was strapped on ready to go and then it could be more properly serviced back in el paso this was Early afternoon at this point, Jeopardy Honors was going to start. Uh, there was a pickup time at the hotel somewhere around five o'clock in the evening. They were not going to make that. Not not with like getting the car checked and then getting back across Los Angeles uh, and then like changing clothes and, and being ready to go. She was like, yeah, I'm not I'm not going to make it for that time. Really sorry. <laughs> and, you know, it was kind of like, does it matter? Uh, I'm glad you're OK, mm. uh, but we don't really know what the honors is going to be. Anyway, uh, it's never happened before. Don't know what it's going to be like beyond what they've told us. It's all right. Don't worry about it. Uh, and we'll see. We'll see when you get back what exactly there is. Mm-hmm. Um, they ended up getting back to, to Culver City. Um, still too late to uh, meet the shuttle that was going to take the contestants and guests who had arrived on time uh, to the studio. But not so much that it was impossible. So I asked our contestant coordinator on site, Lori, it's like, hey, my mom was in an accident. Everything's fine. This was her immediate reaction. Oh no, what's good? <laughs> uh, is everything okay? What's happening? Everyone is fine, but she's not going to make it for this. Can you do something about that? And standing there on the sidewalk in front of, of Culver Hotel, she uh, texts some people back at Sony. About 30 seconds later, she says, we're going to get her cleared through security at the gate to drive in and park in the parking lot. And then she can just let you know when she's there. We'll send you and someone over to escort her over to the courtyard that Honors is taking place in. Everything will be fine. And it was. Like, I got onto the studio. She arrived. I let the production know. We got her. Everything worked out really smoothly, uh, which is amazing considering how many things must have been going on for this event that no one had done before. Mm. (laughs) Um, And that they had a bunch of, you know, important Jeopardy people at. Uh, who needed special attention as well, that my mom merited that sort of special attention was kind of nice. But then through the the rest of the week, whenever they met people involved with the show, it was obvious that word had gotten around. <laughs> mm-hmm. It was like, oh no, like, oh, are you are you too okay? They were sitting in the, because my grandmother is my grandmother and I'm not a young person. Uh, she is quite old and uses a cane. Um, so my mom and my grandmother were consistently seated at the front of the audience. So if there was a coordinator walking by, sound going by, cameras, if they were going to stop and interact with the audience, they'd be like, oh, hi, like, you know, welcome, glad you're here. So nice having an audience again. Who are you here with? 
oh, you're here with John. Oh, you you must have had been the ones in the accident. Are you okay? <laughs> like it's like everyone everyone knew about this except apparently John Barra, who uh, found out about it when I posted about it on Twitter. <laughs> on. Uh, and I would have expected him to be one of the first. But everyone there was so it it was so clear how important. The, like the contestants' lives <laughs> were, <laughs> and the well-being of their guests, and how all of that got handled. I know that my mom, the very first thing that she says, like everyone's okay. The second thing is, I don't want this to like rattle you and your mindset for the tournament. And the way that everyone handled things was just so smooth that it ne- it never did. I'm just really appreciative for that. Thank you for sharing that with us, John, and thank you for coming on to the podcast to talk all things Jeopardata, Geometry, and a little bit about your TOC experience. Now, before I let you go, where can people find you online? And if there's anything you'd like to plug or anyone you'd like to shout out, go right ahead. Uh, I mean, the the key thing is that the website is at j-ometry.com. It's spelled like geometry, except with a j-dash at the beginning of it. Uh, I am on Twitter at T-K-F-O-C-H-T. TK Foked. I did not come with anything else planned to plug. Uh, <laughs> if you uh, are not otherwise supporting a baseball team, please support mine, I guess. Uh, and uh, that's about it. <laughs> and what's your baseball team? The Los Angeles Dodgers. It's been a pleasure, John. And thank you once again. And now this is where I close out the show by asking you to please rate this podcast on whatever platform you're listening to. Post Podium is available on all sorts of listening platforms, including Amazon Music, Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Radio Public, Spotify, and Stitcher. So make sure to follow and subscribe for the latest episodes. I've been your host, Jarek Bruel. And remember, if someone asks what you're listening to, always phrase your response in the form of a question. What is Post Podium? See you next time. Uh-huh.